open. So to those of you who do not know me, my name is Joe Hefner. I'm a longtime member of the Catawba Valley Sonic Club and uh, all around great guy, this lady can tell you. Um, don't listen to anything Jeff says. Um, first of all, thank you for being here today. It, give yourselves a hand for coming out. I tell you what, the last two years, I, I swear I think we've aged 10 years in the last two years. It's, it's been rough, yeah. and we're not entirely out of the woods yet, but here we are, and we have worked very, very hard, literally, down to the minute, to bring you this live event this year. We are broadcasting live on Facebook. Uh, we've tweeted that out, so hopefully we have some folks watching uh, from out in uh, Facebook land there. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, we have put together what we think is going to be a great program for you. We've got some surprises that we will reveal a little later on. We've got a family activity room uh, all the way down that hallway and to the left, I believe. Room one, I believe they have some family style activities. So if you have kids with you, or one of these kind of things, yeah. <laughs> uh, get back in touch with that inner science child that uh, sometimes we forget was there in earlier years. It's, it's one of the reasons why we're here right now, as a matter of fact. Uh, we've got Mill Holland Planetarium here on campus. Uh, we've got some food trucks coming for lunch. We've got the Bob Chuck Marketplace. And uh, as usual, beautiful selection of door prizes back there. So again, thank you. Uh, we have some distinguished guests up here who are going to give some remarks. I'm going to turn the microphone over to Dwayne Trelo, who is a representative of the Catawba Science Center and the Chalk Block, who gives you official coffee welcome. Um, on behalf of the uh, Catawba Science Center, I would like to say uh, good morning and welcome. Um, I know probably at least most of you have been here, either been here since before um, in the past while I've been here. Um, we, uh, I, I discussed this, discussed this with some of the members yesterday, and this is uh, we just started collaborating. Um, the Catawba Science Center and the Astronomy Club started collaborating on Bob Chuck back in uh, 2017. So we've been doing this for 10 years now together. Um, and I, I think quite honestly, uh, the Science Center and the, and the club have been collaborating and, and cooperating on a number of projects, um, at least since 2007. It could have been earlier. I, I've been at the Catawba Science Center um, for, for quite some time, about 16 years now. So I, I know prior to 2007, um, some things were done. But uh, in 2007, we opened our new building and so we, we got you guys on board, and uh, they, they've actually um, helped out quite a bit over the years. We've had some live special events and special programs, um, reviewing the sun in Milan, uh, special astronomy type of programs. So um, thank you, uh, Catawba Valley Astronomy Club. Uh, thank you guys for, for coming out. I, I was kind of joking with Joe earlier when I was over there. Um, I was like, this, this looks like a pretty good crowd, but um, my guess is that more will show up as the morning progresses. Um, I think because of the time change, a lot of folks probably still agree with us. <laughs> and, and, I, and I told Joe, so was I, and, and so is he. <laughs> so uh, you can help wake us up. Uh, I do want to just say a quick thing. We, we, have, um, we have three planetarium programs that we're doing today, or, or shows. Um, they are going to be run by one of our staff members, Dan Drillman. Good, good. Um, they're, they're mostly hands based. Uh, one of them is a, a kids program called One Year in the Sky, and that's at two o'clock, mo mostly for small kids. But we also have a twelve o'clock and a three o'clock called From Earth to the Universe. Um, that's that's a, a good program. It's just kind of a general astronomy, stars, galaxies type of program. But the 
handed us a very short uh, start off of the intro, which might be useful. If, if any, I, I know a lot is going on with Bobcats, but if anybody uh, is interested in seeing one of those shows, um, let me see Megan over here. She has a stack of free admission passes. So we, we don't want to just hand out to everyone necessarily, but if you're interested in the show, get a pass from Megan and um, come to the, it's the building right upstairs, not, not, the, not the two story building, but the, the one story kind of theme park building um, up the hill and um, come go around uh, to the front, go to the desk and tell them that uh, you'd like to see one of the shows and come in and talk to us. Okay? Uh, that's pretty much it. Again, thanks a lot for participating and supporting Astronomy Club and their endeavors. Uh, these guys have worked very, very hard um, to put this this show together. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dwayne. By the way, Megan here also answers to uh, Lord Goddess of Bobcats. So <laughs> please feel free to address her as such and, and bow as, as you approach her. We're not doing anything. <laughs> We're truly not because everything that happens on time because Megan makes it happen on time. So I'm just here to say it. So uh, one quick announcement uh, regarding the pandemic. Uh, it is the CSC policy that if you're in the classroom down that hallway there, that you please mask. We do have some immunocompromised uh, attendees here. And if you don't have a mask with you, we have masks out at the uh, auditorium here. Please get the, the tickets. There's a John Gardner sitting next to me there. And the mask are free. So. Yeah. It was. It was. It was. But there's going to be a lot of extra ones because that's okay. We have to behave because we're doing our own thing. So. I mean, on uh, Facebook. Uh, as, 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 as is the tradition, uh, I will now turn the microphone over to the man, the legend, the one and only, the Bob. And make it quick. the idea for the first Bobcats. This was written in December of 1992. It says, uh, Astronomers of the region unite. We are considering hosting a gathering of regional astronomers at Gardner Webb sometime in January. Thanks for the program and for the range of speakers and yourself, Cody. We expect to hear more about this at the December meeting. Anyone interested in participating is the best time to move the ball forward. Now, talk about a legacy. This is a legacy, and I am so
Judge Pratt has carved this out and has put these steps to a continuum with the level two. If I were on the top of the level two, please don't apply a two-story middle observatory that's made another level two and another gym and think that that is going to be built. Even people who've lived here all their lives, it is not still that way it's built. So please do come visit us tonight. We will have something going on there. I think the forecast is, is going to be uh, 50-50, greater than 50-50 chance of doing something tonight. So please do come uh, and, and visit us. There's a map of the beautiful uh, census uh, program that Megan has uh, looked up for us again this year. And of course, you can use your GPS there. Aiden Middle School I've also asked to uh, remind you that we are broadcasting on Facebook Live, but those videos will be uh, downloaded and archived to the PBOC YouTube, so you can keep reliving the Bob Fest experience. Inventing some new words last night to make it happen, and we did. We made it happen thanks to Gary and Megan being able to do that. That was a highly Megan initiative. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're we're bringing we're, we're being dragged into this 21st century with the help of some other technology. Maybe we'll have a little more. We'll see how that goes. Okay. Is there anything else that I need to ask before I introduce our first speaker? So here at the Catawba Valley Astronomy Club, we have not just a wide bench, but we have a very deep bench as well. Any one of the people who raised their hand a few seconds ago, pick a topic related to astronomy, and they can give you a 30-minute talk on that topic. And most of what they say will be true. That never goes down in depth. best-known solar observing expert. Right here, he moved to this part of the country to be with us. Can you believe that? <laughs> I can't. Uh, and he doesn't regret it. And his wife, Dorothy, doesn't regret it either. Imagine, they, they kindly uh, fit themselves in this culture with the level two that we have going here. And we're so pleased. Check out their tables out in the hall. 
hallway, the photography is stunning. One of the door prizes back there is a handmade quilt from Dorothy. She very kindly contributes a quilt every year. So our first speaker is John O'Neill, very expert solar observer. I've already picked his brain for advice this morning. And uh, he's also a NASA solar system ambassador. Get it up in the way, thank you. So he speaks for much more than the Catawba Valley Astronomy Club, but we can claim him, and we're very proud of that. So please welcome John. Forward half matches and how to optimize your scope through your DSLR, your CD camera, how to take calibration pans and do all that fancy astrophotography stuff. When I do that, I've noticed over the years that the guys in the back of the room usually all sleep and Chris? The guys in the back of the room are always sleep very well. Okay, the guys in the middle of the room are just trying to stay awake. And usually the guys in the really hip to keep sitting in the front row and they're taking notes and all kinds of good stuff. And this year I decided to do something different. Three years ago, I was at the Wearing Star Party with Richard. And I think this oh yeah, this little issue that I make it there. Uh, I probably wore a
you hear me now? Okay. So I sort of came up with a talk called, I am an amateur astronomer and so are you. And there I am at the moon stage stargate with my imaging setup. I've got three or four of those imaging setups depending on what I want to do with like the SCT or the big refractor or the small refractors if I want to do live field. So, you know, I started thinking back about my life as an amateur astronomer. Uh, and it took me a while to realize that. Well, it took me until the pandemic, I guess. When I was a young kid, I didn't think much about I didn't really think, well, gee, I'm an amateur astronomer. I could just do this from my home. That was it. I gotta watch this money thing. <laughs> so as a young man, I didn't think about it much either. I just did it. Uh, it wasn't until the pandemic that I started really thinking about it. I'm sure a lot of you have probably done the same thing. It finally sunk in to my head that being an amateur astronomer, it's, it's somewhat of a distinction, don't you think? I mean, I don't think that we as amateur astronomers are better than anybody else. I don't think we're worse than anybody else, but we are kind of different. I mean, who else do you know stays up all night? Goes and camps out in the middle of nowhere all night in the freezing cold. Right, Gary? Club, the Charlotte Amateur Astronomers, the Chicago Club, the Piedmont Club. I'm a member of all of those. You've got to realize in 2016 when I retired, we moved from northern Ohio to Statesville, North Carolina. And my biggest fear about the move was coming down here, not knowing anybody, not bringing any astronomy kids. What am I going to do? So a year before we moved, we came down here for a visit, and I joined all these clubs. And I started going to club meetings and started meeting these people. And so by the time we moved here in 2016, I had a steady uh, group of friends that I could hang out with and do astronomy with. Uh, I don't know about all of y'all. I guess I don't say that now. I've been here five years. Okay. Uh, but I always felt a little bit different. Uh, and I think the first time I realized that, I was just a young kid. You can see in the top left picture there. Uh, I was sitting on the back porch and my neighbor came out to the barn barrel. Who remembers barn barrels? Okay, he had three big paper, not plastic, paper bags stuffed to the top with rubber. Put them in top of this 50 gallon drum that was full to the top with ashes. And this paper's all sticking this high out the top, and he lit it. And I sit there and watch till my little head started working. And I'm like, where's all that paper going? What's happening? So, like kids do, I run into the house, say, hey, I put a punch pot in. And my dad, he's, he's one of these old fashioned his bike, opened it down, and looked over the top, popped his head, looked at it, looked at me, he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he said, fire is fire. I said, oh, come on, Dad, what's fire? Go ask your mom. <laughs> so I run in the kitchen here. Mom, Mom, where's fire? She told Johnny, fire is fire. Get out. Go play. All right, so my grandparents
And he says, what kind of question is that? Folks say, well, I don't get the answer here, folks. Well, that is kick and grin. Well, that's, that's fine. He said, well, John, when God created the universe, he made the earth, the winds, and the fire, and the water. Fire is what God created. That's all you need to know. Like, okay, so that's when I realized I'm kind of different from other people. It's like, how did my parents and grandparents get to be their age and not even know what fire is or care? That, that kind of kind of set me back. By the way, that's not fire. That, that's what a lot of people look, think when they first look at that. Oh, look at that fire. So when I started fourth grade, fourth grade was like life changing for me. Number one, fourth grade was the start of science class. And I sitting in the back, I always sat in the back of the class. I never sat, I wasn't one of those little kids that sat in the front. I'm in the back of the class and Mr. Gibson says, I'm gonna teach you this year about science about the plant world, the animal world, the mineral world, the natural world. I'm going to teach you everything there is to know about science. My arm shot straight up. Mr. Gibson, what's fire? He says, well, Johnny, we'll get into that a little deeper later in the course, but let me tell you right now, Fire is a chemical reaction that takes place where enough fuel and heat is introduced into an object. As molecules heat up, they shed electrons, create more heat and light as the object and the fire is consumed and changes shape. And there I was sitting in the back of the room and it's like my head just exploded. I had no clue what he just said. <laughs> but it's like, I want to know what he just said. I want to learn more. And that's when I decided I'm going to be a scientist or I'm going to be somehow involved with science when I grow up. And I think that day that's what got me started. The other thing that happened in fourth grade is that's when in Ohio back in the 60s, that's when we were introduced to the school library. And they took us on a tour and they told us you can take any book in this library you want home and read it. So I started taking home science books. And I'd read them cover to cover. As soon as I finished one, I'd go get another one and another one. By the time I hit high school, I'd read all the, all the high school books on science they had in the library. Once I got to high school, I started reading the college textbooks. I, I just loved science. It, it just fascinated me. And I think it does a lot of you guys here in the room today. I don't know, my thirst for science and scientific stuff was insatiable when I was a kid. Uh, another important milestone in my life happened at about that same time. In 1963, it was a kinder, gentler time in our world. <clears throat> Every evening, our family would gather around the TV to watch the evening news. Who remembers Walter Cronkite? That's a newsman right there, folks. Uh, they didn't deal in sound bites. And they, they told stories. And one night we were sitting there, and President Kent, one of the, or at least at the time, I thought one of the most powerful men in the world came out. And he said, within the decade, we're going to put a man on the moon, and we're going to bring him home safely. And we're not going to do it because it's easy. We're going to do it because it's hard. And boy, that just fired my mind. That's what got me interested in NASA and a whole lot of other people, I think, too. Uh, so I watched the Apollo program, the Mercury program, the Gemini programs over the years. And come 1969, by golly, we landed a man on the moon and brought him back. Anything they had televised, I attended programs at the 
school where they showed stuff that NASA was doing. And in 2017, I was asked if I would like to be a volunteer for the NASA Solar System Ambassador Program. I don't know if I like that title. I've been doing it for seven years. And I'd encourage anybody that's interested in NASA to write to them and get involved with this program. Basically, you just go around and give talks like this to the public. And, uh, they don't pay me for it, but they sometimes give me free handouts. And if you go look out on this table in the hallway, there's a lot of handouts out there. Uh, 50 years later, that was just a few years ago, uh, I was fortunate enough to have some of my pictures and stuff put on display right here at the Chicago Science Center. Uh, they did an exhibit. It was up for, I don't know, it was more than a year or two. Uh, it was hanging out there in the hallways. So I was kind of proud of that. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So one year at Thanksgiving, when I was a youngster, we stayed at our grandma's house. We always stayed at our grandma's house on Thanksgiving because that was the night our parents were still with us. And they could go out and get gifts, bring them home, and hide them, and do whatever it is they did. And we weren't there to be in their way. So that night we were kneeling by our bedside, just folded our hands and bowed our head. I got a glimmer of an idea in my head. <clears throat> and I started praying in a really loud voice. My dear Lord, please tell Santa that I'd really like a telescope for Christmas. Amen. So when Grandma left the room, my little brother said, Dad, why are you praying so loud? God's not deaf, he said. And I thought, wait a second. God is not deaf, but Grandma is. <laughs> but my plea went unanswered that day. <clears throat> my Grandpa, however, in the other room was deaf as he was for me. And he gave me his old 7 by 35 binoculars. And I got a lot of use out of them. I learned a lot about constellations with them. And the town where I grew up in the 60s, 700 people lived there. We had a store, a post office, a cabinet shop, a grocery store, and an auction house. And if any of you ever been to auctions, you'll find them. People would come from miles and miles to attend our auction. And I worked at the, at the one store in town. I was a clerk, a uh, stock clerk. Not, I didn't handle money. I just worked food on sales and stuff. And I had saved up over the course of about a year, $11. It's in 1963, and a 10 or 12-year-old boy had 11 bucks in his pocket. And I was at the auction, and lo and behold, they had a Sears 450-pound, 60-millimeter equatorial refracting telescope on the auction block. <coughs> now, I wasn't allowed to bid. You had to be an adult. So I grabbed my dad's arm and started tugging. Dad bid on it. Go all the way up to $11 is the last bid. Because I was willing to spend every penny I had in the world for that telescope. Well, he started bidding, and there was another guy across the way that was bidding, too. Well, eventually, the guy came over and talked to my dad. I didn't know this at the time. I found out later. And he said, are you buying that telescope for yourself or the, for the boy? He saw the boy want it. I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I don't know what to do with one of those things. But it's for the boy. The guy said, okay. Stop bidding. So I got it for seven bucks. <laughs> Here I am with my very own telescope. I still got four dollars left. I was still rich. So I grabbed that scope up. It was pretty heavy. I was, I think I might have weighed 80 pounds at the time. I started down the stairs, tripped, dropped the scope. It rolled to the bottom of the stairs. I rolled to the bottom of the stairs, hit my head on the scope 
stood up to God and was like, he was sorry as this man. Actually, I made that story up. That was Dorothy dropped the telescope, and it rolled down the stairs. Fortunately, she grabbed the railing. She didn't roll down the stairs. And there, there's a picture of the scope. And I bought that more than half a century. Well, I said maybe more than half a century. Maybe I just got a little old. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I still have it, believe it or not, along with dozens of other scopes. I got about three refractors, one reflector, two CSPs, two H alphas, one calcium, one sodium, one projection, two radio telescopes, a spectroheliograph, and a chronograph. All those scopes accumulated over the years. I never learned nearly as much as I did with that little C 60 millimeter telescope. Uh, I learned the importance of a good mount with that little telescope. I learned the importance of lab, of optics. I learned how to measure degrees, arc minutes, and seconds. I learned how to use setting circuits, how to calculate fields of view, calculate magnification with eyepieces. I learned all the basics with that scope. So if you ever think you can't do anything with a 60 millimeter scope, I'll beg to differ with you on that. They're not the best thing in the world, <laughs> but they are usable and you can learn a lot from them. So by the time I got to high school, I was still working at the store, and I went and bought a six inch Reflecting space talker. <laughs> wow, what a scope. And that's when my that's when I decided I want to be an astrophotographer. And my golly, did I ever try to do astrophotography with my big $239 six inch scope? But it, it didn't work. So as soon as I got out into the world and got a real job, I went and bought me an eight inch need. Need was a brand new company back then, 1972. Uh, bought me an 8-inch, uh, custom-built. It had a turned-down 8-inch mirror with uh, oversized elliptical secondary in it because I had an Amaya large-format SLR camera at the time, so I needed a really huge mirror with filled with field of view. And that was my main scope for a lot of years. When I bought it, I bought an eight-inch Need SPC because there was no way I was going to get that big Newtonian in the belly of an airplane without spending more than what the scope was worth to fly it out there. So during lunch one day at work, one of my coworkers was reading the newspaper. He always we read the newspapers while we were. That was acceptable in the field then. Uh, he said, look, you're going to be an astronomy club leader down the road from here tonight. And that blew my mind. I didn't even know there was an astronomy club in Ohio at the time. I was 18, 19 years old. Uh, so I went. And the guy that told me about it, his son, that's in, a, in the Orange Park area, Mike Hart. He's, uh, I was in 70s, mid to high 70s now, and we're still best friends. He still lives in Ohio. We talk at least once a week still. How many of you guys made friends like that in years past? Lifelong friends. There's one, two, three. That's it. Oh, my God. Oh, okay. Here's a couple more. Okay. I've been involved in a lot of different clubs and a lot of different organizations, uh, scout, ham radio, all kinds of stuff I've been involved in. But the friendliest people you're ever going to find are in the trenches. I, I, I've been nice to 
How about you guys? Yeah. A lot of tiny keys in here. And here, here's just some other people from my past. Uh, most of these I selected because they are lifelong friends, the ones that are still with us. Some of them have moved on. One guy that really impressed me when I joined the Messiah Club, his name was Carl Sepp. Uh, he was a huge man, four foot eleven, but big in stature. Uh, he was a commentary observer and imager, and I'll be forever indebted to this man because he's the one that turned me on to Tom. He said, "John." No two Toms are ever going to be alike. Every single Tom that you see is going to be different. Even if it's a periodic Tom that comes back every four years. Every four years when that comes back, it's going to be totally different than it was the Tom before. And if you miss that apparition, you can't ever make it up with someone else. Once it's over, it's over. And that, that kind of made me want to go out and start looking at topics. I mean, we can all go out and look at the Uriah Nebula every year now for six months at a time. And it's, and it's never changing. It's the same thing all the time. And after doing astronomy for a couple decades, it's like, okay, I'm tired of looking at that stuff. I want to see something different. And comets is just the tool. And to think that there was a guy that lived 10 miles from me with a little telescope like that could take pictures of comets that would blow your socks off just gave me the idea that I had to do this too. I wanted to see this stuff and I wanted to share it and I wanted to show it to other people. And here's some of the comets that I've taken over here, just a couple. The High Pataki, hale -Bopp. One in the bottom left is Comet Neat. That was one of the very first comets I imaged back in the 70s. Bottom center is Halley's Comet. Bottom right is Holmes. I don't know what the one in the upper left is. I don't remember. But there's a list I compiled of the comets I've seen, and there's like 54 of there. I'm over 60 right now. I just haven't updated my list in a while. I've seen over 60 comets in my lifetime. Uh, and the things I've seen, uh, you guys remember when Comet Shoemaker-Levy crashed into Jupiter? That was, that was something. How about with Comet Holmes? Uh, let's see if I can go back. That's it. That's it on the bottom right. At that time, that circular coma you see, which is large in diameter, as our sun. That's how big that thing was. So when it lost that much mass into space, I, I really don't know what's going to happen. In, in fact, if it'll ever be that bright again or not. I'm going to skip some of this just because I only have 45 minutes. Yeah, the, the old guys, when I joined my club the very first time back in the 70s, it was a totally different era, a totally different time. Back then, you didn't have me or us now, all the big scope manufacturers. You see the guy on the left up there, well, he's in the left and right picture. Uh, the guy with the red suspenders, Roy Anderson, he ground the mirror for that telescope in front of us. He rolled that tube. He cast the aluminum parts. He designed an electronic hand control system. Everything you see on that telescope came out of his hands. He designed it and built it. Back then, that was the norm. Everybody in the club built their own telescopes. So when I showed up in the mid-70s with my store-bought telescope, all the old-timers were like, well, did you grind that mirror? No. Did you make that mount? make the tripod? No. They're like, well, then what do you got for your problem? <laughs> you handed someone some money and you got something you have no investment in, except for the money. Uh, 
because i have a lot had to show this yet so i went out and built probably the first mobile observatory you've ever seen in ohio and that did it was an old sixty three ford with a pool bed on the back and i don't have a laser you can see there's cylinders there. Those are hydraulic cylinders out of a convertible top. So I would pull the thing up, face it north, and I could hit a button, and the cylinders would lift the truck up off the suspension. So when I got in, the scope wasn't going like this. It was nice and sturdy. And I used that truck for quite a few years and convinced the old timers that I was worth at least a little bit of merit because I did make something. And I'm sure that numerous astronomers went through the same thing with Goku. Remember that when Goku first came out? Why do you want one of them? Don't you know how to star hop, kid? <laughs> the best answer I heard was a friend of mine got MS. He was a racer. And he got MS and couldn't race anymore, so he went and bought a telescope. And the first time someone confronted him about it being a Goku, he said, I'm 63 years old and I got MS. You think I'm going to learn the sky like you did over 30 years? I'm going to push a button and let it go. Yeah, I like that one. So my astronomy club in Ohio, this was them before I was even born, 1949. That, that was the club. I know about six of those, and the rest are all gone by the time. I'd encourage any of you guys, if you're not in a club, join one. Uh, your dues will help the club. Your experience, your personality, your enthusiasm will enrich the club. The club's experiences and personality and the people in it and their enthusiasm will enrich you, invigorate you. It, it's a two-way street. So if you're not a member of a club, join one, and you will see benefits. Uh, I've had a few accolades over the years uh, for astronomy. My very first, I think, was my picture of Halley's Comet taken in 1986. Uh, that's a 35-minute exposure, and back then we didn't have electronics. You had an eyepiece with an off-axis guider, and you look through this thing, and you had your hands on the hand paddles, and you sit there and you guide it for 35 minutes and put that thing on the trough here. That's, that's how it was done back then. So I, I'm really proud of that picture, even though it's not a very good picture, but Halley's Comet in 1986 was not a very good apparition. So that's about the best anybody got. Uh, for a couple years, I taught uh, astronomy to Vermilion Middle School kids. Uh, the Board of Education is, in the 80s decided that there was a bunch of bright kids, and they were just bored because the school curriculum wasn't up to their level. So they thought, well, if we bring some people in that know stuff about things, they can talk to these kids and help advance them somehow. And we did it for two years, and they decided, well, it wasn't working. They were still doing the same things in school as they were before, so they dropped it. But at least I got to do it for a couple years. So, in 2016, Dorothy and I, she had been working at the school now how long? 20 years, I've been there 42, and we said we're retiring, and we're moving to North Carolina. So we packed up our stuff and we moved here, and the first thing we started doing, I think the very absolute first thing I did was go to Nice. Anybody ever been to Nice? Okay, a couple nodding in there. Uh, nice is like astronomy mecca in the world. It's one of the best places you can go and see yeah, everything. 
anything and everything shown to this niece. She really did love it there. Please go. Uh, we want to start going to Peak State, Okie Cats, Winter Star Party, Solar Fest, Astronomy Festival on the National Mall, Bob Fest. We went to them all. And I got to meet some people there that I otherwise wouldn't have met. That's Bob Moore in the upper left. He runs the Northeast Astro Imaging Council. And he asked me to give a talk, and I did, and I had a standing invitation ever since to go back. I think we've gone back twice, and then the pandemic put the nix on that. Uh, bottom right's Gary Parkerson from Amateur something, Astronomy Technology Today magazine. I met him, wrote some articles for him. That caught the attention of Charlie Warren in the upper right. He writes astronomy, Amateur Astronomy magazine, and I started writing for him. And uh, That's probably one of my proudest achievements as an amateur astronomer is writing for that magazine and getting to share uh, some of the things I've learned over the years. Uh, just two or three issues ago, Charlie had me and Dorothy pose and we got onto the cover of Amateur Astronomy, which for me, uh, being on the cover of Rolling Stones would be as important <laughs> to me as being on Amateur Astronomy magazine cover. Uh, I'd encourage anybody too to if you're if you like amateur astronomy, get that magazine. It's a black and white magazine, but it's thick, it's glossy. And Charlie is probably the ultimate amateur astronomer. This guy, he's one of us. You'll see him at the star parties. Yeah, this is it right here. You couldn't get more than me on the cover. <laughs> Some of the things I've seen in the sky. Uh, Tim, you were asking about the Helix Nebula. There, there's my picture. There, there's the Helix. Uh, people call that the Eye of God. Uh, to the right of that is the Pillars of Creation. Uh, eclipses. I've seen so many lunar eclipses. I can't even remember them all. Uh, I've seen northern lights. Living up in Ohio, we got to see a lot of northern lights. I haven't seen any since we moved here. So, well, it's happened. It's happened. Yeah. Ronnie Farrell, I don't think, no, he passed away. Ronnie Farrell has some beautiful pictures from 1986 he shot from right here in St. Louis. Okay, I've just been told I got five minutes, so I'm going to start rushing. Uh, the Great American Total Solar Eclipse of 2017. That was the most spectacular thing I've ever seen. How many of you saw it? Oh, yeah, look at all the hands. Awesome. So if you go to Leakey, Texas in 2023, you can see the annular eclipse. And in 2024, you can go to the same place in Leakey, Texas and see the total solar eclipse. They're going to cross paths right to meet. So that's where we plan to be. Well, I was going to talk a little bit about outreach, but I think uh, I'll just skip over that part. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that an amateur astronomy is a much better life when geez, I'm going to get a little dizzy is involved in it and your cohort in crime uh, especially when she says yeah go ahead buy that new obsession telescope <laughs> go ahead get that astrophysics mount we've been looking at you only go around once 
Okay, how nice is that, guys? And they, they say we're each born with a potential to become whatever we will. And I think I've pretty much lived a good life, and I think a lot of you guys and gals have too. Uh, being an amateur astronomer is a whole lot of fun. It's fulfilling, and when you share it with others, uh, it's just good. As far as our future plans, I'm 68 years old, so I'm not sure how much of the future I have, although I'm counting on at least another 30, 40 years. Dorothy's 28, so she's got plenty of time. <laughs> uh, we're going to continue writing for the magazine, sharing our love, doing talks to anyone that will listen. Uh, we're going to keep going to talks, or to eclipses. And after the eclipses are over, we're going to do an Aurora tour. So if I can pass along any sage of advice or gems of wisdom, I just say to y'all, continue to be a stronghold of light. Look out for each other. Be kind to each other. Be tolerant to each other. Continue to do public outreach and share with each other. And above all else, bring some youngsters into the group. We're always looking for youngsters to get involved in the group. So with that, I am done. Does anybody have any questions? I know this was kind of a talk for questions, but okay, sounds good. I'll turn it back to Joe. Thank you, John. Uh, seriously, any, any questions for John? talk is to begin at 1045, so we have some time for some club announcements, so any, anyone uh, from a club that is doing something interesting or would just like to talk without a mic, please come up and take my mic with one hand.
one of the things that we were talking about was it may be worthwhile to consult the astronomical league to see if they have some guidance on how to make sure our clubs, our outings, our meetings, especially when we're doing things in the dark, are safe. We know that the dark is not unsafe, but we want to make sure that everybody is safe. So here's a quick rule of thumb. Anytime an adult is having interaction with a youth, there should be two adults present. You should have a QD approach, right? So if a, a youngster is at a public observing event, and we always have youngsters, and we love having youngsters, and we want to get them fired up, like John got fired up when he was, you know, I don't know, six years old or whatever, when uh, Kennedy made the announcement, and he got the gun and called him. But we want the kids to be excited in order to be safe. So if you've got a telescope, we're showing kids stuff through the telescope, and a second member next to you so that you've got some, uh, you've got some backup. But uh, it's just a word we want to pass it along. We want to make sure everything we're doing is safe. We do not want to have, you know, two men show up uh, with a satellite truck at one of our events to ask questions, and we do not want anybody to go, 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 go. because that's how we grow. We grow by providing safe, fun activities where everybody, kids of all ages, kids of any age, can get a plus discount on astronomy and, uh, and science and, and have a good time. So anyway, that's all I got to say about that. Thank you for your moment. Eat and spend money. We have door prize boxes. We have people with tickets. We have gold tickets. We can take your money by cash. We can take your money by credit card, by debit card. We did have a way to accept tickets, but we lost the, uh, the soup got moved Well, we are right on schedule, so we've got 10 minutes till the next talk. Our speaker is here, so let's just hang out for 10 minutes, and then we'll get started with the next talk right on schedule. Dan, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. 